tell the people to let you go. Mm -hmm. Would you like to stay here? There's nobody there, just you and me. Don't look at them. You will get back to your dad and mommy. Can you smile? You don't know what did nobody smile to you ever? Yeah? Brian, can you smile? Yeah. Yeah, you can. And maybe look at me. Look at me. Smile at mommy and daddy, they love you. You see, you do not smile. Slowly. Close your eyes and smile. Close your eyes. Look at nobody. Okay, you glance nice. Again, close your eyes. Just one smile. You feel look at that hand is much better. You could straighten your legs. You can bend your head. Just smile when nobody sees. Smile for yourself a minute. That's right. And look. And I was. He feels you and him. He's always used with stiff legs. Look with me, it's soft. And you must learn to do that. Now, if you take it with that usual look, you step again. I only took that. That's right. No. No, no, no. Now, what should we mean? Look, if you do that, his body straightens, the leg straightens, and softly, not difficult. Not okay. Not with silly, not with spasticity. No, not with spasticity. Now, would you please you treat him as gently as I did? Just like that. So that he can feel sometimes that he smiles spontaneously. You know, what, how does, what's the tonus distribution over the body normally, over the musculature of the body? I'm not asking the amount or anything, but is there a difference between the different parts of the different muscles? Hmm? Yeah? Yes or no? There is. Which muscles do you contract more than others? While you do nothing, while you sleep, which ones do you contract more than others? You, you, maybe you don't understand the question. Look, when I sit now, which muscles in my body are contracted at a higher have a higher tonus than others. My mouth? The long huh? The width? The long muscles. Which long muscles? Look, I have no long muscles that are contracted different from the others. I'm actually having no muscles contracted different from the others anyway. Look, it's the same right of contraction everywhere. And by the way, you don't believe me? Look. Which muscle is contracted more, which is less? Which is 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 it? Huh? Huh? Now, I can tell you which is more, which is less. Now, that's this is more, and the other one is less. That's more. 
And by the way, when I am angry, then do I contract my fists or the rest of my body too? No. I do only with the fists. You see, you make with the fists. I'm angry, I'm angry. Don't you see that I'm angry? There is I say I'm angry. Can you see my voice? Everything gets angry. Therefore, you see, there's a actually tiny uh, which muscles now are stiff? The long muscles are stiff. Which stiff? If there is anything stiffening, it's not muscles. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> now, it is actually a general rule that the state of excitation <coughs> is the same throughout the body. If I'm doing nothing and sitting like that, then obviously all my tonus is... But if I stand like that, then my body is like that. The entire body is like that. Now, in other words, if you rethink of that properly, it means that ideally all the muscles should have the same tonus. It is not like that with most people. Though it's when they are in ideal state, they are like that. But when they come to a state like that, and there is Gidele, Ariel there? No, he's gone. We're going to work with some Olympic people, maybe. Some Olympic champions. And that's an extraordinary thing. That some, some champions, some real skilled people, have learned to do it by themselves. Because it's a general rule. It's a general rule that if you, that your body is organized so that the tonus is the same all over the place. In other words, you know what that means? It means that the big muscles should work harder than the small ones. You don't realize that. What is a big muscle, what's a small muscle? Small muscle, big muscle is to do as far as muscles goes, goes only with that. That's a big muscle, and, and that is a small muscle. You see? Because this one has less fibers. And therefore, when it contracts, it cannot contract to become as short and as hard as this one. In other words, a gluteal, a gluteal muscle can become that big. That big. But the digital muscle, how thick can it become? It has about, one has about a hundred times more fibers than the the thin one. And all the fibers getting the same tonus. Therefore, the strength of the small muscle is a thin muscle. It's, it shouldn't say a small, it's thin. Because the strength of the muscle is coming out of the, of the amount of contraction. If the muscle is long like that, to begin with, you see, that's his length can't be because he's already contracted. Or if that is the state where he's not contracted, then the number of fibers here is enormous. And then when he contracted, he will go off from there, his head will become here, and he will become like that. And the amount of shortening and the amount of power will be that if you had the power of contraction per, per inch of contraction or centimeter of contraction, is five kilograms. 
or it takes centimeters and kilograms, and this is 10 centimeters, then the amount of power you can get is 50 kilogram meters, 50. There will be 50 pounds of pull, 50 kilograms of pull when the muscle is contracted. But you couldn't make with that finger lift 50 kilograms. If you put something here and lift 50 kilograms, that muscle will never do it, can't do it. But it is important to know, to realize, that an ideal, an ideal nervous system with ideal muscles, with an ideal skeleton, would have actually that kind of thing that all the muscles in the body, you see, all the muscles, exactly with like my hand, then my mouth and my tongue have the same rate of contraction. And that's the penny we call it's my mood. In fact, my mood is the rate of contraction. Now my mood is leisurely. Now my mood is now I'm going to do something. Then the entire tonus has changed everywhere. Now, anybody who wants to challenge me now, come on. You ready to fight? Then you see my, my contraction is infinitely superior to what it was before. And it is throughout the body. But usually it is not so. For instance, if you have a leg which is aching, then you say, look, I'm going to show you. But that leg will not get the, the superior tonus. In other words, there can be derogations to that rule. But ideally, it must be ideal. And therefore, it's actually non-existent. Therefore, Olympic champions of high quality are not existing. In fact, it happens occasionally that one of them reaches a state where he can do it, and he says, I was in particular good form. What does it mean he was in form? He was in form so that all the muscles worked easily, and then he found that just go and jump is nothing. And by the way, some champions, and you will hear and read them, read about them, that some chap, one of the biggest jumpers in the world, would go in that and would say, go on that. Okay. Then approach the bar, stop, do nothing. Just go away. He would do it seven, eight times. Each time, approaching, and then in the end, he will just go and look as if he did again the same thing, and go over and with the lightness, like if the wind carried him over, and he goes over two meters thirty, one of the best jumpers in the world. He does that. So some people have the neck. What does he do? He organizes himself that what he means by the jump should be like, like he's doing nothing. And when he gets there, he actually comes to that and it looks like if there's nothing to jump over the two meters thirty. And believe it or not, Nijinsky had the same idea. Nijinsky, I read it in his own handwriting, that he, nobody would understand. Diaghilev and anybody else in his place could not understand. He would go, yeah, yeah. sit behind the stage, behind the curtain, and sit there, and sit there, sit for two hours. And he would do the kind of thing, lift his leg, tiny like that, and put it back. Lift it and put it back. And he would do that for two hours, sitting and doing nothing. And they always thought that he was a madman. Actually, in the end, he was a schizophrenic and finished in a mental home. <coughs> but he still was Nijinsky, and that madness and, and genius are not far from one another. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> so he was doing that. And 
Nobody realized what, and nobody knew how. And then he waited until the moment he would have to come on the stage while the show was going on. And then doing that, he would come on the stage at the exact note where he would have either to jump or fly out of the window. And he flew out of the window. Everybody saw him flying out of the window. He used to do that. It was one of his great shows. He would dance, he would go in, make two things, and then make a movement and fly, fly out of the window. And people who saw it tell it until today. They don't know how he did it, but actually he describes it very clearly what he did and how he did it. And his idea was he sat there until he felt that he doesn't stand on the floor, but the floor lifts his legs. And then in other words, he felt actually the kind of that, what you would feel, look, until you felt that your entire body got exactly the same tonus throughout the body, but the minimum, minimal stuff. And then when he got like that, he did it, right? And then you found that he could get up, look, now as I do now, to get up, but you wouldn't feel the difference. You wouldn't feel the difference. Look there. Now, if I were in that state and just jumped out of the window, with that state, and made sure that when I'm out of the window, I'm not jumping forward where you can keep on seeing me that I'm falling down, isn't it? But go out of the window and be just out of the window and disappear there. Then you find the man get out of the window and actually flew in the sky and disappeared. Everybody had the impression that he flew. So you can see how, and it, it happened now with one of the champions here in, in, in the Olympic Games, that he did exactly the same thing, and Nijinsky described it in his own handbook, in his own diary, described what he did. But while he was alive, nobody knew what he was doing. And he actually describes that he did feel until he felt that, the, that when he stands, I feel, felt the kind of thing that you would do if you stood with one leg. Look, look, you can put the leg where you balance and then <coughs> you see, and you can stand like that until you feel that the leg can move that way and that way, you can take it off and there and there. It, it, then, of course, what sort of tonus is in the leg on which I stand? You see? Um, and, 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 and there's no end to it. But it is an important realization that what we do and the kind of thing that you feel when you get up after some of the movements we do, and the way we do it, that you actually get up and feel that you walk yourself and find, what do you feel, are you taller or the smaller? What's the feeling? How do you feel taller? Obviously, to feel taller, you must not do that. In other words, a muscle cannot make you feel taller. A muscle can only not pull you down. In other words, when you feel taller, it means you stop pulling down. And that normally, you actually pull down. And the incredible thing is, of course, that if you do that, you'll find that other people learn it in a completely different way altogether. They think unless you can go down, you can't go up. And therefore, if you learn to go down completely, which is much easier than getting up, and then you get down until you can go down.
and get up. And then some Japanese masters learn the five wind sort of kata that way. They learn to get down. And, and there are many, many ways of doing that. But you can see that the skills that we have are infantile. We get only the kind of thing which by, by, by if I want to do it, I do, uh, sit there and then, uh, all right then, see some, uh, take my hand, oh, I can't touch it, and then push it and push it and push. Oh, it's painful there, but that doesn't matter. I will reach it. I will reach it. I will reach it. I will reach it. Let it, I will die, but I will do it. And, bah, 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 bah. and then they do it and they died.
Okay, ich denke, wir werden heute in diesem Gesundheitsgespräch nicht die große äh, Kritik an unserer Gesellschaft mit ansetzen, wie alles besser gemacht werden könnte. Aber was wir heute vielleicht leisten können, ist ganz gezielt den Kindern, die leiden, einfach handfeste Tipps mit auf den Weg zu geben. Und einer dieser Tipps wird sicherlich auch darin äh, bestehen, dass man so ein bisschen auch versteht, was sich da zum ja. Beispiel bei einem Angstzustand auch im Körper abspielt. Und Frau Dr. Koch, das wäre dann jetzt wahrscheinlich, mal gucken, ob Sie das beantworten können. Ich bin ja selber jetzt neugierig, was Frau Mai Meixner, an Sie, äh, an ein, was, Sie eine, was für eine Frage Sie haben, Frau Meixner. Ja, grüß Gott. Grüß Gott. Ja, ich ja, hallo. In der, grüß Gott. Ich habe gerade in der Reformhauszeitschrift gelesen, ähm, dass äh, Stress zu Angst wird, ist logisch, und dass dann vermehrt Cortisol ausgeschüttet werden und dass diese äh, zu hohe Konzentration vermutlich die Nervenzellen im Gehirn schädigt. Also die, der, äh, Sie haben das schon richtig gelesen, so <lacht> in mhm. etwa. Also mhm. der Mechanismus ist folgender. Ähm, die, das Gehirn ist ja sehr, sehr abhängig von einer ständigen Blutzufuhr und damit auch zur Aufnahme von Sauerstoff und von äh, Nährstoffen. Ja. Und ähm, bei, einer, bei einem chronisch erhöhten, Stress, also wenn, wenn da ein chronischer Stress ist, dann mhm. ist die Glukoseaufnahme im Gehirn gestört. Aha. Dann haben die Neuronen, also die Nervenzellen, eine verminderte Energieaufnahme. Mhm. Und dann kommt es zu chronischen, also immer wiederkehrenden und chronischen Ausschüttung von Cortisol. Das ist richtig. Mhm. Und dann gibt es Schäden, gerade in den Regionen des Gehirns, die zum Beispiel sehr wichtig sind für Emotionen, also im Hippocampus. Und dann gibt es Leistungsminderung, Gedächtnisminderung, Lernminderung. Ähm, dieser Hippocampus, das ist so ganz in der Mitte des Gehirns, so eine Region, ähm, der ähm, auch für äh, speziell für Emotionen eben zuständig ist. Sind Und, auch diese Spiegelneuronen angesiedelt? Nee, die sind ganz woanders hm? angesiedelt, aber, aber über die können wir ja. nachher vielleicht auch noch reden. Die sind mehr im Frontalhirn angegeben. Ähm, aber dieser Hippocampus ist deshalb so wichtig, weil wir auch wissen, dass alles, was mit positiven Emotionen gelernt wird, dass man das viel besser behält. Also alle freudigen Sachen, ob man jetzt, ich weiß nicht, einen Lottogewinn hatte oder, das behält man natürlich viel leichter als etwas, was man negativ hat. Ja, ja. Und ähm, wenn diese Region geschädigt wird, äh, vorübergehend oder auch dauerhaft, dann ist da tatsächlich eine große Leistungsminderung. Und so wird erklärt, also erklären das die ähm, Neurophysiologen, ähm, dass eben diese erhöhten Stresssituationen und die Ängste, dass die dazu führen, dass auch eine schlechtere Leistung ja. da äh, kommt. שיחבה <laughs> ובכן רואים שאצלנו במוח יש, במערכת הצדים, יש ארגון כזה שמליד רשות ראשונים מכיל את הריר. וזה לא שייך לאוכל, זה שייך לארגון של המכונה. באו הארגון הזה, ובכן הטענה שלו הייתה שעל הקוטקס מלכתחילה אי אפשר לעורר, לגרות נקודה אחת באופן חזק מבלי שזה יתפשט מסביב. אנחנו ראינו דברים כאלה כבר בעצמנו, שזה ברור. כשאני למשל לוקח חלקים בגוף שעדיין לא הפרידו ביניהם בקוטקס, זאת אומרת שלא היה שימוש לא היו קונדישנט רפלקסס לפי ההבנה של, של פאולוס שגרמו ללימוד הזה אז כשאני רוצה לקחת את האצבע הזו הנה הנה הן שתיהן הולכות 
אבל באצבעות האלה שאני רגיל בהם הרבה יותר, זה לא בעיה, אני יכול לקחת את זה, אבל פה בבבא אין אורחות יח. אצל פסנתן מאומן זה לא הולך יח. מה זה רוצה להגיד? ששני תאים קרובים אחד לשני, אם אחד מתרגש, אם יש גירוי באחד, גם השני עובד. פחות או יותר, אבל הוא, זה עובר לצד השני. יפה שאם אפשר, אם להביט על הקורטקס, כמו על חתיכת גומי, ולבער את האימפוסים האלקטריים בדבר שאפשר לראות, מפני שבחשמל לא כולם מבינים על מה מדברים, אז תארו לכם שיש חתיכת גומי, ואני לוחץ מלמטה באגרוף. אז אני לא יכול להרים נקודה אחת. אני מרים נקודה אחת יותר גבוהה מהכל, אבל מסביב גם כן לגומי נמתח ועושה גירוי, זאת אומרת, יש גירוי גם בתאים מסביב מסביב. גירוי שלא התכוונתי לו, אני התכוונתי רק להרים את האמצע. נכון? אותו דבר בקוטקס, אם אני מגרה נקודה אחת, זה באיזו דרך שהיא, שתלויה בבניין הקוטקס, עושה שכל הסביבה מתגרה. כל השנה מיליון. ובשביל שאני אוכל לגרות נקודה אחת, כמו שבמקום להכניס אגרוף עיפרון, ושנקודה אחת תתגרה יותר ויותר מכולם, ובאמת אז יוצא שגם מסביב יש גירוי יותר קטן, והוא מעניין שטח יותר קטן. אם אני לוקח אגרוף, אני נניח שהקוטקס שלו הוא איזה חצי מטר מרובע, זאת אומרת, מה דבר כזה, אם אני שם יד ודוחף, אז כמעט כל הקורטקס מתגרה. זה מותח את כולו. אם אני שם יתרון דק ומותח נקודה אחת, אז יוצא שנקודה אחת כמעט קורעת את הזה, ומסביב הנקודות עולות, אבל כל העניין הוא צר מאוד, וכל הקורטקס יכול להישאר כמעט במנוחה. זאת אומרת שכל מה שהגירוי הוא יותר לוקלי. יגרו יותר חזק בנקודה יותר גדולה, כן, הקורטקס יותר מושלם, יש לו שליטה. הוא יכול, למשל, בעקבות האלה זה ככה, זה שני תאים שנמצאים במרחק כזה שצריך מחטים דקות וזהירות מיוחדת כדי שאפשר יהיה לגרות את השריר של האצבע הזו מן האצבע הזו בלי לגרות את השניים. אבל פה לא חשוב איזה תא נוגעים, אם נוגעים בזה גם זה עובד, אם נוגעים בזה גם זה עובד. זאת אומרת שיש בקורטקס אפשרות לעשות נקודה אחת מגורה והנקודה על ידה לא לגרות. וזה אפשר לעשות על ידי אימון. זאת אומרת, עם יצירת רפלקסים מותנים בדרך הזו, שפבלוב הוכיח שהיא נעשית במעבדה. ושאצלנו זה נעשה בדרך הטבע במקרה. יש כמובן הרבה דברים דקים וחשובים בדבר הזה. עכשיו הבעיה משונה, אם אני מגרה נקודה אחת בשביל שהדייקנות של הגירוי תהיה לא קלה, זאת אומרת באמת רק הנקודה הזו שאני רוצה. הכרחי שכל היתר של הקורטקס יהיה אינהיבטד, זאת אומרת בלום. זאת אומרת שהתאים האחרים צריכים, צריך להיות בהם משהו שמפריע להם להתגרות, נניח, למשל דוגמה של בלימה, נניח שאם אני רוצה ש... לגרות בגומי הזה נקודה אחת 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 באמצע, אז אם אני שם סביב היתרון טבעת ולוחץ אותה עד למטה, אז אני באמת אוציא רק נקודה אחת וכל הסביבה תהיה שקטה. לא יהיה שום הרמה של גומי מסביב. אם אני בלי הטבעת, אז זה ישנו. אי אפשר שלא להרים משהו מן הסביבה. אפילו אם אני מרים משהו דק, אבל בכל זאת זה מתפשט לשטחים הרבה יותר גדולים מאשר התכוונתי. והקורטקס שלנו עובד בדיוק באותה הצורה, ש... אם רוצים לגרות נקודה אחת, מוכרחים שתהיה בלימה. צריך שכל יתר התאים יהיה להם משהו שמפריע להם לעבוד, אז אפשר לעשות... זה נראה כל כך תיאורטי שלא שייך לעניין, אבל אם אתם שמים לב רגע לזה, 
איך אנחנו לומדים סוף סוף לאמן את שתי האצבעות האלה? זה לא שאנחנו יכולים לעשות משהו בשביל להפעיל את האצבע הזו לחוד. אנחנו לאט לומדים להפריע לזוז, להפריע לזוז לזוז, להפריע לזוז. קודם ביד ואחר כך בשכל. אני מפריע לזוז לזוז, זאת אומרת אני עושה בלימה. ויוצא איזה דבר משונה מאוד, שאם חושבים על זה, בעצם כל הלימוד שלנו זה ללמוד לבלום. זה לא ללמוד לגרות, כי אם ללמוד לבלום. אם אדם שמים אותו במים בשביל שחייה, אם אתם שמים אותו בפנים, הוא עושה כל מיני תנועות. מה הוא עושה? הוא עושה בידיים, ברגליים, דומה מאוד למה שהוא עושה בזמן שהוא שוחה מהר. אם תסתכלו לזורקים כלב למים, הוא עושה את אותן התנועות כמו בשחייה. אם נותנים לילד, הוא עושה בדיוק את אותן התנועות. רק מה, הוא לא זז מהמקום, מפני ש... הזמן של הדחיפה של הידיים, והזמן של הסגירה, והעוצמה של הפתיחה, והעוצמה של הסגירה שוות. היוצא שהוא עובד על המקום. מה, איך הוא לומד לזכות? שהוא מתחיל לבלום את ההחזרה הפתאמית של הרגל אל הבטן, בשביל לדחות ברגליים, הוא עושה את ההחזרה לאט ואת הדחיפה מהר. הוא כבר סך. לא חשוב מה שהוא עושה אחר. מספיק ש... התכווצות והפתיחה לא תהיינה ריתמיות. זאת אומרת שלא, שהן פריודיות אבל לא ריתמיות. זאת אומרת שהתנועה, לאט אחר כך אפשר ללמוד לעשות בכל תנועה, לעשות כך שהתנועה האחת ארוכה ואיטית והתנועה האקטיבית חזקה. אבל בעצם בשביל לשחות האיש למד לבלום את התנועות שלו. הוא לא למד תנועות חדשות, הוא למד רק לבלום את התנועות הלא רצויות. ברגע שהוא בלם את התנועות הלא רצויות, הוא יודע לשחות. אותו דבר על אופניים, אדם יושב על אופניים. מה צריך אדם לעשות בשביל לנסוע על אופניים? שום דבר. האופניים בנויות ככה, שהגלגל וההגה הולכים בכיוון תמיד של הצד הנופל. אם האופניים נופלות ימינה, ההגה מסתובב, מפני שהציר הוא לפני ההגה. אם שמתם לב, ואז זה סוחב את הגלגל לצד הזה, זאת אומרת שהוא בעצמו מייצב את עצמו. מכיוון שיש עוד מכניזם בסיבוב של הגלגלים, וכל זה עושה שהאופניים מתייצבות בעצמם. כשמושבים אדם על אופניים, הוא מפריע להם והוא מתחיל ליפול. אבל מה הוא צריך לעשות? הוא צריך ללמוד לבלום את התנועות שאינן נחוצות. בשביל לייצב את האופניים. זאת אומרת, בזמן שהוא נוסע והוא נוטה שמאלה, האופניים בעצמן הולכות שמאלה. אבל האדם מתאמץ ותופס בשתי ידיים ומנסה ליישר אותו, אז הוא נופל. אם במקום ליישר לא יפריע וילך בכיוון הזה, אז זה ממשיך לזרום. יוצא שללמוד לרכב על אופניים צריך ללמוד לבלום את התנועות. דבר משונה, שלא לא היו חושבים עליו, לא, לא היו חושבים על הקופקס ועל הצורה הזו, שכל הלימוד נעשה על ידי בלימה, שהגירוי בנקודה בא מעצמו. בכל נקודה של הקופקס הגירויים באים מן הטבע, אבל שהגבה תהיה מאורגנת ומשוכללת ומתאימה לכוונה, לנחיצות, צריך ללמוד לבלום את כל הסביבה ולגרות רק את אותן הנקודות שנחוצות. ורואים כל פעם שמשהו לא בסדר, יש אותו דבר כמו בשחייה ברגע הראשון. כשאדם מאבד את השליטה של הבלימה, אז פתאום הוא כולו פועל והוא לא עושה כלום. הוא רק נרגש. למשל, אנחנו רואים את זה במקרים מיוחדים של אסון, של, של פחד גדול, של אה, סכנה פתאומית, שיש התכסות כללית, אין כל בלימה. אז כמובן כל מה ש... בן אדם הזה עושה, או הבעל חי עושה, זה בכלל לא פעולה, זה משהו שמאבד אותו בדרך כלל. הוא, הוא הולך לאיבוד, הוא מת, הוא נהרג, מפני שכושר הבלימה נעלם. ואם תסתכלו, הוא יוצא שבלימה, שליטה, זה אותו דבר. מה זה? זה רוצה להגיד, יכולת לארגן בקורטקס מצבים משונים של גירוי ובלימה. 
שאפשר לגרות ולבלום, לפי הנחיצות המיידית. וכיוון שאתם ראיתם שלקוט כזה יש תכונות מיוחדות, שיש לו דברים כאלה שאם אתה מגרה אותו לא בעיפרון כי אם ב- באגרוף, אז כל הקוטקס מתגרה. יוצא שהרבה דברים שמתחילים להבין איך לגרות, מה לגרות, מדוע גירויים אחדים גורמים לזה, גורמים לאחר, רואים שאופן שה- הארגון של הקוטקס בזמן שיש עליו גירוי הוא חשוב מאוד. נניח אם הגומי הוא דק מאוד ורך מאוד, אז אם תשימו עיפרון, אז הוא ירים רק נקודה אחת והיתר כמעט לא יזוז, יחבק את העיפרון מסביב מסביב. אבל אם הגומי עבה והמתח בו חזק, אז תשים את העיפרון הכי דק וירים חלק ניכר מן ה... ברור, כך שבקופי זה חשוב, המצב של מעבר הגירוי מנקודה לנקודה, כמה זה גורר, כמה... מגירוי בנקודה אחת עובר לנקודות השכנות שלו, איך זה עובר? זה הדבר החשוב ביותר בשביל לתת לנו את המוסר הזה בין שהגוף הזה, המערכת הזו יכולה להגיב באופן מדויק מאוד ומכוון מאוד ודק מאוד או שהיא לא יכולה. אתם רואים, זה משונה, פה אתה מוכרח להשתמש במילה יכולת. זה בדיוק על מה שדיברנו, שיש מצב של יכולת. יש מצב כזה של מערכת של הקורטקס הוא כזה, שאפשר לגרות בו איזה נקודה שרוצים, ובאופן הכי אבסולוטי, המקסימום שאפשר, ושהיתר לא נכנסות לתנועה. ואפשר להביא את זה למצב כזה שאם אני מגרה את, ה, את הנקודה האחת הזו, כל המערכת מגרה. למשל, אני יכול עכשיו... לגרות את, את אותן הנקודות ששייכות לדיבור או להגיד או לדבר בשקט גמור ועד שכמעט לא שומעים אותי. אני יכול להגביר את זה יותר ויותר ויותר עד לצעקה ואם נחוץ עד לצעקה נורא ועד שנקה אבל כרגע אני יכול לעשות את מה שאני רוצה פחות או יותר. אבל תארו לכם ברגע שמישהו פוגע במצב כזה שהמערכת מתגרה מעצמה ופתאום כושר הבלימה שלי איננו, אני כרגע אינני יכול לתאר לי איזה מצב היה עושה את זה. למשל, תארו לכם שאני עומד על, אני יודע, על, על סירה קטנה ב, ב, בים ומישהו... דוחף אותי לתוך המים, אנחנו במרחק ענקי, במים קוראים, אז הצעקה שלי איננה בשליטה שלי, והקורטקס, אני באותו רגע, להוציא נעימה דקה או בנחת, או לחשוב על לשנות את זה, זה מחוץ ליכולת שלי, מדוע? כל הקורטקס מגורה, כולו בבת אחת, כושר הבלימה נעלם. כושר הבלימה הלך. אהההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
sometimes I wonder myself how much there is so much to learn that the, when I look at myself, how much I have been through that learning, studying and finding, almost observing with a, with a bird's eye what's happening. And you can see, you, can you know things that everybody else knows them. Anyway, the, the people who, who write books on physiology and neurophysiology, somehow they know that thing in the back of their mind, but they never seem able to delve it on. All they do is to make another berm, another guinea pig, cut up and do something to it and tell you something about how it be. And never draw any conclusions for their own behavior thinking very often i suppose somebody said it that they, you know you have skinner and the others teach pigeons and and guinea pigs to do things and somebody <laughs> made it as a joke or i think he was maybe serious and think you know what the mouse thinks when you she's being trained by skinner or by anybody who does experiments like that it makes him do something like that and then gives him a piece of cheese. And the mice think, look, I've trained that guy to give me a piece of cheese every time I do this. <laughs> huh? And that's a goal and goes, tells it, but left goes home and tells, look, you want cheese? You go there and you'll get cheese any time you do a trick like that, you'll get a piece of cheese. <laughs> now the question is, Actually, who made the experiment on whom? On whom? <laughs> yeah, we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. There's it's a little boy of a few years, something like six or seven years, maybe less, maybe more, but I don't really remember, who is, uh, you will see, a completely cerebral palsy, stiff all over the place, and had probably never had, <coughs> never had pleasure out of his being, except by being on the stool or something or by eating, maybe. Though he's in such a state that uh, even that is very doubtful. And you will see the way of relating to a kind of child like that and how we succeed in actually making that communication which I told you which is an exchange between two nervous system through a sensory connection. And when you look at it, you will see that it works in a way which is more surprising than understood. Ready? Yeah. Can you hear that? Thank you. 
The maid didn't get it? Hmm? The maid didn't get it? The maid didn't throw it away this time? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's so long at the beginning. Now there is one thing, of course, that you can see in my preparations with a child like that. The, the time passed to get the, the child to be considered as a being of his own and not as a number in a hospital. Uh, with the way you think, you just put it down, push it and pull it and it takes so long that if you want to skip that, like you can skip that. But to me that is the most important part because you will see what happens to the child after you relate to him like that. He has never been related like that in his life. Should I may pay, have paid attention to something which is usually not done. When the child came, I didn't talk to the mother, to his mother. I talked to him. I related to him and didn't bother at all about his mother. In his presence, he was the important thing in the place. No mother, no father, no anybody else. He is the important thing. And some mothers and fathers at the beginning feel completely strange that I talk to the child. I ask this child who can't answer, I ask them, is this your mother? Not the other way around, not the mother, is this your child? Which is obvious. But I ask the child, is this your mother? And for the first time in his life, somebody asked him a question like that. And that in itself makes a tremendous change. He, even if he can answer, he will probably keep quiet for a few seconds, look at his mother shyly to find out whether he can say whatever I ask. 
It's for the first time that he is a person in his own right. And you will see the effect it has on him in a few minutes when he has digested. And I'm trouble careful with a child who can't answer, who can't, try, who can't cry, and is shy to do that in a strange surrounding. I will not cause the slightest pain to him, not the shadow of pain. And you can see how delicately he's handled. Morning. Maybe you move a little bit after the, because we have brought so many things we would like you to see the essential. It's not really important. The, just move a little bit faster that because anybody, nobody understands what it means really, the movement. Yes. This is where we are here. Yes. You can tell me when you want Go to. ahead. When I finish with the board. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, but, but, <laughs> looks cool. You can see well that he has no control over his feet at all. He has no habit of standing or doing anything. There? Huh? Do Go ahead. Now, in a minute. Now you can stop it a little.
And you see, when you watch that, you couldn't realize that this child doesn't know what it means straighten or bend the leg. It's like a piece of wood. And you see, it, when you look at that, you say, why did he come there? If he can't do that, what's the odds? And you will soon see or hear that he knows that very well, that it is not regular to be like that. You see, no ability to sit, even it collapses. And if you see, you will see it in a minute, what's being done is actually look, teach him to use his elbow to lean on. And of course, that will induce him afterwards, afterwards for the first moment of crawling to use their hands on the floor for crawling, which he has no idea of doing. In other words, it looks improvisation, which it is, and the improvisation is, for his sake, the thing that he can't do and that he feels that I feel I can make him look. You see it? Now, you see you turning the head and now making him use the elbow, which he doesn't. You can't use the hands at all. Look, and then you will see the head is headed to make the necessary organization for the entire system to use the elbow to support him. Look, and you will see what happens. Can you see what happens? The head falls completely in without any connection with the situation. Look there. You see, you pull him, he doesn't even know how to turn the head relative to the pelvis or nothing. It's a, a dead limp of, me of meat. And now if you want to understand, you see the sensation being now in the elbow to the head then there must be something which makes the, the next part of the function means move the head re correctly relative, correctly is an idiotic word, but move it in the normal configuration of the head relative to the elbow. And that brain registered that. There you see, I help the head and the shoulder to fit the movement of the elbow. And you would think that this is like uh, trying to teach the wall to walk, but it isn't, he has a brain. And you will see that that brain makes actually 
extraordinary efforts now to look, you will see, watch, and you will see how intelligence comes through slightly, gradually but surely. And watch how the movement of the head relative to the rotation becomes clear and he makes no mistakes. Look, and then I lift his head, you see, again. And then, look. Then you will see, that's right, put the hand and then loop and uh, it's innocent. Can you see that his head has no connection with the hand? Look, there he leans on my forearm. There. And now, a number of repetitions with the elbow touching the bed will, in the end, you will see, will touch. When he begins to touch with his forearm, the bed by himself, and not before, I will do the same thing by moving the head through the same trajectory that he has done up to now. And you will see that his brain becomes so aware of that that he, he begins an hysterical reaction to that. It's not I who decide when to stop, can you see? He will decide me when to stop because I feel him and he feels me. Now you can also see clearly what I mean by function. You see that left arm of his is entirely beyond his control or any connection with the head, but in peculiar special maybe movements in sleep or somewhere. Now you see I move the hand and now that hand, and then I don't know whether you noticed that when he was lying at the side, I moved the knee to touch the elbow. And watch, you will see what it does. Look there. And why you cannot appreciate that, but in the hands, I can feel how gradually the movement of my hand, look, will turn his head and his pelvis. Look, he begins to turn over. Look, it's the first time he turns over while I turn his knees. Before I turn the knees and it didn't mean a thing to him. Now, gradually, look. And you will see, look, that this side he does already, but if, look, and the other one not. And Watch and see, can you see how very a minute thing like that, like turning 
to the other side is a major enterprise. And if you are in a hurry, if you don't feel where his difficulty is and why or how he doesn't relate the movement that he does to one side to the other, then there is no chance for him for the rest of his life. Can you see now I'm beginning to show him that he can turn the other way too. Look there. Here. Can you see it's innocent, it doesn't see it's so slow that if you don't understand what's being done, you can write prescription. You move the leg right and move the leg left. And then pull the arm and then do this. When? How? How long? And by the way, can you see that the boy becomes softer and softer and begins to be able to do something that he, look there, look he straightens his legs now and his arms above his head. You see, there's no idea that they had it to be lifted when you roll to the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't show it to you that he can't, but because you will see that in this session, what he can do is beyond anything anybody would expect. What he learns to do. Look, that arm, he never stretched it, the elbow, the, the joint is not formed in. You can't straighten that, uh, that arm. You see, the every movement that is initiated, which is necessary, will be repeated so many times until you feel in the hands a reaction of doing the same thing coming from his system. Once you begin, that happens once or twice, the, then the sign is. But if you don't feel it, you would never detect it. It's as a slight as a. Uh, Look, now, can you see what I'm doing now? Moving the head, and look, he will move the elbow and lean on it. Can you see, plop? That's part of the function of getting up. Is, look, he actually does it. You can see the fingers of his hand. Look. Eh? And then watch, he uses his elbow. Look, he uses his elbow. Do you realize what achievement that is? That his brain now feels that when you move with the head to get up, you have to lean on your elbow. What do normal children do? When does he stop giggling, does he? <laughs> when does he stop? At the very end, all right. Ah. Can you see, that's the kind of thing he should have done when he was a few months old. <laughs> Look, suddenly you have hands and things that move instead of being a lump of stiffness. Look, you're becoming alive. Look, and then touch with the hand. And, uh, Look how he looks at me now. 
He doesn't understand what's happening to him. Look. Now, huh. that is priceless. For him, it's a unique chance of catching up with what he has missed in the previous years of his life. Now look again, he moves the elbow now quite clearly. Look, look. And then the head is taught to do the movement, which relieves the arm and necessitates his use again. Now, when you look at that, think what happens to a child like that when he's given to the, in the hands of a very good surgeon. He would try to make each muscle shorter or longer so as to make the thing feasible. But how would it happen? What difference does it make if you cut the arm here or lengthen the, the hamstring or you don't? Or fix the foot or not? He will never use it for standing anyway. Now watch it, watch. Yeah, elbow is now without failure. Look, marvelous. By the way, you see it's the first time that he left the elbow, lifted the elbow and left the hand on the bed. He didn't lift it, the, the forearm spastically. Mm -hmm. Ah, marvelous. Ah, 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 ah. You see, you may not realize that this is after a day's work with you, and yet you can see, I don't know how long it will take. Normally, it would take half an hour, but here I won't stop it before he feels that he has enough, and it takes so long as he can last, and I.
Ah, can you see? He turned now the other side and moved on. Can you see how quickly that system improves? It's almost hard to believe. And believe it or not, when some, some of the people who saw it who have no preparation, they said, obviously he was prepared for that. That the time was ripe for it. That's why it hoped. You see that, that how far misunderstanding can go? By the way, you can learn how speech begins with the movement of the hands and the head. Look. Wait a minute, don't, don't disturb him, he will get frightened. <laughs> now he will see, he will see, he will use his arms now in a way he has never done and will lift the head probably. By the way, listen how many words were exchanged between him and me. And yet, look at the amount of learning he has done without speaking. Can you see what I was doing? That is the, the pattern of lifting the head. Muscles of the lower back will begin to contract and then up along from the pelvis to the neck and then the delta is and then the head will lift. But it must be done gradually until that system was never known that will connect the movement of the muscles in that way as will form for it the idea of lifting the head. And it must be constructed just like the elbow, like the hand. And therefore anybody who has no idea how it functions, how it works, can work with that child 15 years, he wouldn't get what he'd get in that lesson. Watch and see. You will see that suddenly he will use that right hand that he has learned to use, look, and lift the head already. Huh? Now you can see that when a neurologist fixes that that child has minimal brain damage, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. Because that minimal brain damage, if you listen, examine his intelligent quotients, by the amount of learning he does in one hour, he's a genius. 
not a minimal brain damage. By the way, watch it. How comes that there's so much to say? Can you see an idea? Looks innocent. But not to move, just to move, but have an intention of reaching something and reaching it. That's it. Can you see what is he waiting there for, holding his foot? He waits for him to lift his head. Look, and they will help him to do that. And of course he does. Ah, ah. No. No. Loop and now. Now he goes after it. Look at that. Watch now how he's beginning to move the head from right to left, which will enable him actually to respond to the movement of the knee. That I, no, look, there, there, there. And you say he has minimal brain damage. Look at that. (laughs) 
it may be funny in, uh, sometimes when I feel that when it begins to cry like that, I remember that I, when I first saw the Chapelle 16 in, in the Vatican, where the God holds the man here and stretches his hand, giving him life. Another one just touches and gets alive. Look, look, he learns to swim now. Look there. Uh, no. <laughs> Can you see that child never crawled? Couldn't he crawl? You can imagine if he were a man's a little bit before. You see, there will be a moment where he moves his leg in correspondence with arms. You don't feel what I'm doing now, because it's not seen. You see, he has no idea of stretching his leg to push. He has no idea of that. Now, if the leg is bent completely, of course, nobody would feel that the muscle can do something. Therefore, I do it almost on a stretched leg, touching his foot on my chest, and producing an irritation so that when the arm is, the leg is almost straight, then side as soon as you feel that push, then you can go making it more pronounced and more clear because the impulses arrive from the brain through the spinal cord to stretch the leg. If you do it when it's difficult, the, the, nothing will work. It will never come through the other muscles of the body. It will not be connected. Can you see what fun it is now for him? And look with what speed he does it. Look. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Can you see? And then he will touch his own knee for the first time in his life, probably. <laughs> hey, he did. And by the way, that's how life is made with us normal children. But nobody realizes when he's grown up that it takes so much work to do it. But the child does it in his own time and does it.
Hey, hey. Can you see he pushes me? Hey. And then he will push the floor. In the beginning, you have to do the stretching of the leg and the pushing so that he feels the sliding on the on the floor. He hasn't got an idea that he does. Can you see that he would talk if he were organized like that at his early child? Look how much talking he's doing now. But, but who can understand it? The intonation you can. How old is he? Huh? How old is he? What, what do you think? Probably for uh, six years or five years, six and a half or something, something of that order. We, we know it, it's written somewhere. Hey. By the way, when you will see his second lesson, you will see that he is, uh, we are old pals. And what he does in the end is a kind of hysterical f satisfaction that you never had in your life. Ah, look at that. Look at that. I don't remember whether it was this, the mother of that when she left, she said, that certainly was not physiotherapy. <laughs> 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 eh? Look at that. Can you see he uses his leg to crawl and the arms? But one movement like that is a tremendous effort. Look.
去。Can't take it. Goodbye, Jonathan. Who? Hold tight. Look, lift your hand, that's nice. By the way, you didn't see the improvement of the use of his hands in crawling. That's why I did, actually. He learned in, in the normal sum. <laughs> Come on, use your hands. That's marvelous. Marvelous. Come on, here. Hello? 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 Can take Ready to go, Neil? Do you have a good time? Yeah. Okay, can you turn over on your back? Oh my God. Can you turn over on your back? Oh, that's, there's no bed that way. Hello? Oh my God. Hello? Um, we'll do one more time later. Mommy, play too, okay? Can I play too? No, hey. look, look, look. Eh? 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 Ooh. Thank you that's very right. much. He doesn't have to thank you. Already thank me. Look, 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 look. Uh, yes, we have to go away. Okay? Bye. <laughs> hey, I know. It's hard to end when you're having a good time. It's somebody else's turn. I thank you on his behalf because obviously he did the greatest part of the work. The achievement is his, not mine. <laughs> eh? I, was a, I was instrumental to make him an environment for the first time that allowed him to catch up a little bit of the kind of thing he missed by the ignorance and stubbornness and inability to think of the people around him. And by the way, I told you that you don't know what you're learning. You will only realize that 30 years from now. That that is something which has in it the inherent elements of life itself. And I bet anybody in the world to repeat that performance in an hour and 20 minutes as you saw making out of a dead this interrible. I actually feel if I were born like that and had the treatment he had and there was nobody to bring him that happiness that he had during that hour, can you realize what sort of change it makes in his entire feeling and a kind of internal kinesthetic appreciation of the world around him? You imagine that if he had a, another, uh, not much, tomorrow, next day, another less, another five less, you can see what can be done with a baby like that. And you, uh, if you, it's a pity that it was not shown exactly 
what sort of shape he was, and you can't really appreciate by the touch. He felt a limp body with a head. You could see sitting with no head, no relation of anything. Absolutely futile, not crawling, not sitting, not anything. Oh, if you hold him, his head falls back, and the hand, nothing. And when you take him down, you come straight. The left arm in the joint, there no elbow there. It's not an elbow joint, it's an elbow joint ankylosed from the moment of birth until today. Therefore, the applause is certainly greater to him than to me. My achievement in that is an hour's work. To him, it's a major change in his life. And you can see what it means when I talk about the nervous system. And then you can understand what I mean when I say consider a function. Now, for him, each sort of movement which was connected to some sort of initiative and achieving it, like crawling to get that, that is an, in, an intent, it's an intention, which is realized, realized by having produced the elements of which, by the way, the elements, the elements instead of the, what was it? Ingredient. Huh? Ingredient. By the way, can you see what a silly brain I have? We were correcting the manuscript yesterday, and in some parts I took the ingredients of movement, because it was not a question of the elements, but of the, like in food, an ingredient that is missing. And therefore, I wrote ingredients of movement. And of course, he being a cook, and the ingredients meaning to him, ingredients of, of food, and movement, ingredients of movement, it somehow didn't connect in his brain. And I look for another better word, and I didn't find. I thought that if you talk about ingredients, you realize that when you talk about movement, like about food, and I thought I was killing 15 birds with one shot, saying ingredients of movement. Now, the real word would be elements of movement. Then, then what does it mean to anybody, an element of movement? What's an element of movement? What's the element of movement that I scratch my nose? What's the element of movement? Is that the element? Is the bending of the feet? Is, the, is it moving towards the nose? Is it this, the movement of the fingers? What's the element of movement? How about components? Components, exactly. Then who knows what you're talking about? <laughs> but when you talk about the ingredients of movement, whether you want it or not, you carry it over from one discipline to the other. You think about ingredients. Ingredients is food, and that means it is a major effort, a major change in the food if you put a little bit of saffron and you don't like it, or you like it. Then it changes the whole taste of the food. And the food, in it, how much is there in it? 15 a grain? You may have it in a pot of soup. The ingredients of movement, whether you want it or not. And I believe that that is the right way of saying it. And I fought with it. Now when I say elements, I thought, look, the word would be elements. Then if you say the elements of movement, somebody would read it, so would would mean elements of movement, obvious. Elements of movement. He wouldn't stop thinking another second. But if you say ingredients of movement, it can be a minimal brain damage. He will think of something which is related to food and carry over some sort of induction, deduction pattern from food to the movement. And after we will realize that salt, it's only a little bit of salt that makes the whole thing edible or not edible. Or you put a little bit too much, you can't eat it at all. Now, in other words, if you want to scratch your nose and you do that movement a little bit too much, you can't get your nose. <laughs> Therefore, ingredient to movement the ingredient of movement, to me, is a major discovery. It took me a lot of thinking to do that, to just to connect the two. And I give it to an editor who is, has a very fine taste of English. And he finds it, look, ingredients of movement, find another words. I couldn't find another words that would make them. 
And now when I talk to elements of movement, I told them, now imagine you write that phrase with the elements of movement. Then what will you read? You just read it, you wouldn't even stop a second to think. But when you read the ingredients of movement, unless you are a complete idiot, you would think of it whether you want it or not. Whether you read it, even if you let the next phrase, then you would stop. What do you mean ingredients of movement? Huh? Now can you see? That's, that is correct. It is that kind of thing that makes that possible. 